Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Jesus College and the Intellectual Forum, and this, which is the first event of this new year, 2023. And it's great to have you with us, whether you are here in person in this wonderful Frank Van Hall, or you're watching us online. One of the great things post-pandemic is our ability to have people join us from around the world. And we have well over 120 countries that we've had people come to events now, which would have been very hard to fit in beforehand. Now, some of you I know know Jesus College extremely well. For some of you, this may be your first time here virtually or, or, or for real. So I thought I'd just say a couple of words about this place because it has been a center of, of thought and religion for an incredibly long time. It was originally set up in 1144 when the then Bishop of Ely, Nigel, gave a small plot of land for some, to some itinerant nuns. Uh, then developed in the 1150s when King Malcolm of Scotland gave the rest of this land to the nunnery. Um, I still don't fully understand why the King of Scotland owned this, but I'm sure Nicola Sturgeon or somebody can explain. Um, and it continued to develop for a very long time. Uh, in 1496, the, the then Bishop of Ely decided to come and see how things were going with this wonderful religious institution, and he reported that there were two nuns left. One of them was rather elderly, and the other was of ill fame which you can interpret however you like. Um, and so he kicked all the women out and turned it into an all-male college, something we have since fixed. Um, but there have been many other people over the years who have really led thought. Uh, so Cranmer and Malthus. Uh, more recently, Lisa Jardine, uh, who, who was a brilliant scholar in so many ways. Um, and perhaps most recently, uh, some of you may know Clean Bandit. Uh, Rockabye, I'm seeing a few nods. There's an age profile here. Um, but they were all here as well. And the Intellectual Forum was set up about six years ago now to try to get more uh, open discussion and thought and to reach out beyond the boundaries uh, of our college. Uh, and it's in that spirit that we are here for what I think will be an absolutely fascinating event tonight. Um, so we're going to hear about the Bloomsbury Lent book 2023, written by our very own <coughs> senior tutor, uh, Paul Dominiak. Uh, who's had a number of other roles uh, previously here uh, as Dean of the College. Then he travelled many, many miles away to the other side of the road uh, at, at Westcott uh, before coming back uh, relatively recently. So we'll hear from Paul um, about the book. And then we have two fantastic discussants uh, to respond and to begin some of the conversation that we have. So it's a great pleasure to have Bishop of Croydon, Rosemary Mallet, and thank you very much for being with us, and Claire Gilbert as well, uh, who runs the Westminster Abbey Institute, both of them are also visiting fellows here at Jesus. So this is an all-Jesus event to discuss uh, Jesus in the run-up. <laughs> it's going to be very, very appropriate um, about all of that. So we'll, we'll have some conversation there, but then a chance for people to ask questions, raise comments from here in the room or online, just use the Q&A feature. Um, so I'm delighted to have you here. I'm delighted to have such a wonderful start to the year. Paul, over to you. Do you want to say a bit about the book and all, all your thoughts in it? to come over here. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? I don't think my mic is on. There we go. We're, we're, we're live and operational. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, huge thanks to Julian and, and the IF team for putting this event on. Huge thanks to uh, Claire and Rosemary for commenting on the book. Uh, most of all, thanks to all of you for attending. I'm just very glad the TV pickings were so slim this evening. Um, I've been asked to say just a few words and give a short reading uh, before it, turning over to Claire and Rosemary. So I thought I'd explain a little about the book and what I hope the book does. Now, a book is a bit like a child. In order to understand it, you need to look at who or what gave rise to it. So I just want to talk about the origins of the book uh, to begin with. The conception of this book emerged from various discussion groups and seminar groups over nearly a decade as a university chaplain and affiliated lecturer here in Cambridge. And these groups and seminars in very different ways all touched upon how faith and doubt appear to clash, might or just might well coincide and mutually enrich one another. So I'm indebted to the students of all faiths and none involved in those groups over that decade for their breadth of beliefs, their openness to different perspectives, and their inquisitive rigor. 
this book would not have been conceived without them. The faults of this child, however, are completely mine and not theirs. As a result of these origins, the book itself is both conventional but also unconventional. So I just want to spend a few moments explaining what I mean by that, and the ways in which it's conventional but also unconventional. This Lent book is conventional in that it takes the form of a set of meditations. Meditations on the last words of Jesus on the cross as he dies. From as early as the second century, Christians gathered these seven last words, these seven last sayings, from across the gospel accounts of Jesus' crucifixion. And over the subsequent centuries, Christians developed complex and recurring ways of meditating upon those seven last words, especially during the season of Lent, which ends remembering the crucifixion of Jesus and Good Friday. And many of those religious practices persist to this day. If you go into any Anglican or any Catholic <coughs> church, especially in the final week of Lent, you're very likely to encounter one religious practice or another that will touch upon or revolve around the last words of Christ. So in this sense, this book is conventional. It's conventional because it's just another small drop in a devotional ocean suited to a long Christian heritage. But the book, I hope, is also unconventional. Discussions with students of all faiths and none over the years showed one persisting and common thread that united all perspectives. That was namely the experience of doubt. This was sometimes doubt within the ecology of faith or from a faith perspective, within the life of a follower of Christ. More often than not, it was a doubt about the intellectual and moral credibility of religion wholesale, and certainly of Christianity in particular. So this book unconventionally focuses on doubt as a result. So I hope it will be of appeal and interest to those who are skeptical about faith, or those who experience profound doubt within their faith. The way this plays out within the book is that each chapter meditates upon one of the seven last words of Christ, but as it does so, it does so in constructive conversation with some of the most significant and well-known skeptics of religion. These range from the masters of suspicion all the way through to new atheists some of whom are pictured here on the top row, and some of whose uh, images will be familiar to you. Each chapter puts these thinkers into conversation not only with one of the last words of Jesus, but with a wide range of contemporary, global theological voices, some of whom are pictured here on the bottom. Those who are eagle-eyed of you may well observe that the top row is very much full of white male Western thinkers, while the bottom is, well, not quite that. Now, in a few moments, I want to read just from the introduction a little bit that speaks more about the motivation of the book and reflects about the nature of doubt itself, the provocation of the work. But before I do that, I just want to have a brief Oscar moment, if you'll give me a bit of time. I just want to have an opportunity to express my gratitude to those who have helped give birth to the book, some of whom are here in the room this evening, and others of whom are online. Now, it's utterly invidious to single out any individuals, but I'm going to do so nevertheless. I'm especially grateful for discussions over the years with Guy James, who's over here, with Harry Cheetle, who has uh, uh, sang in the choir here, but also many members, such as Jackie and others, from the choirs of Trinity College and Jesus College who engaged in conversations over the years, 
but more broadly with students on Tripos and on the Bachelor of Theology degrees at Cambridge. Those conversations were the kind of fertile seedbed out of which this book has grown and whose perspectives have been enriched by all of those conversations. Grateful to Robin Baird Smith for commissioning the book in the first place and taking a leap of faith uh, when I pitched it to him. Uh, I'm especially indebted to Robin for his care, patience, and sagacity, bringing it to completion under very pressured conditions. Grateful to Sarah Jones and Sarah Head, who assiduously and efficiently oversaw the book's production and publication, indeed to the entire team at Bloomsbury. But above all, I'm really thankful for the careful proofreading of the manuscript by Dr. Rachel Knighton and for her invaluable moral support uh, throughout its writing and production. So I'm just going to read uh, a little bit now of my Oscar moment. Uh, and while I moved back to the centre seat, I'm just going to leave you with this great quote uh, with which I'll end uh, the reading. Uh, a kind of great, great pithy uh, line from uh, Ernst Bloch, who was a, uh, an East German Marxist uh, philosopher. This book focuses on doubt. It does so for two reasons. First, the crux of this book is that doubt broods in Jesus' last words spoken on the cross. In Latin, the word crux means cross. It now figuratively means something like a painful conundrum, a chief problem, or a decisive point of interest, the crux of a matter. This double meaning of the word captures what this book addresses. In the early 16th century Reformation, the German church reformer Martin Luther proclaimed that the cross alone is our theology. He claimed a biblical sense of the centrality of the cross for Christians. Our conundrum, a problem, a decisive interest, however, is that what we hear at the heart of the cross is a lament. The only last word on the cross repeated in more than was one gospel is Jesus' cry of dereliction. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? speaks this word at the falling of dusk in preternatural darkness as he nears his final breath in agony. Might at first consider such doubt to be unremarkable. Ambrose of Milan, an early church bishop and saint, considered that Jesus' doubt on the cross was a very human response to think oneself abandoned. While that remains true, Christians claim that Jesus is God incarnate. We cannot quite so neatly separate out Jesus' humanity and divinity as he speaks this painful last word, so close to death. The one whom Christians recognize in the orthodox formularies of faith <coughs> as being both fully human and fully divine in one person screams out, that God has abandoned him. Little wonder that St. Paul writes about the scandal of the cross. At the epicenter of all the last words on the cross, it's a dark and violent word of doubt spoken by God to God in the face of horrendous evil. Shock waves of this one word shudder through all seven last words that Jesus speaks. Second, doubting God is hardly unique to Jesus. Doubting God is a decisive characteristic of our human condition with which we must all wrestle at one time or another. People of all faiths and none have doubted God throughout history. Each epoch has a right in its own way to be called an age of doubt, and not least our own. 
All religious doubt, however, grows from the same root of uncertainty. As soon as we talk about God, we are caught up in a dilemma of faith. Faith means to put trust in something or someone we perceive to be trustworthy. Doubt is logically dependent upon faith. It is uncertain belief in the trustworthiness of the object of faith. The author of the Epistle to the Hebrews defines the theological virtue of faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The definition captures the dilemma of faith. How can we steadfastly trust that which we cannot see? For Christians, God is inherently trustworthy and certain because God is perfect. I am the Lord, we hear in the scriptures, and I do not change. We are exhorted to trust or have faith in God's fidelity. Trust in the Lord forever, we're told. For the Lord, in the Lord God, you have an everlasting rock. But God's perfection remains above and beyond all of creation and all human knowing. St. Paul puts it, God dwells in unapproachable light whom no one has ever seen or can see. Elsewhere, St. Paul writes that even as we taste the sweetness of God in this life, for now we see in a mirror darkly. This gap is the falling of dusk on unabashed certainty. Doubt looms in the penumbra between knowledge and ignorance. Doubt attends all experiences of faith. None of us can slip out of our own skin. Neither can we escape the incommensurability between our creaturely finitude and the radical otherness of God. This book joins together these two fallings of dusk. Jesus' doubt on the cross and our common human experience of doubt. This book explores how religious conviction remains possible, even without certainty, and how faith and doubt necessarily coexist. Each chapter in this book meditates, then, on one of the seven last words of Christ. And they do so in conversation with some of the great doubters of Christianity and religion in the modern world. East German Marxist philosopher Ernst Bloch once provocatively observed that only an atheist can be a good Christian, and only a Christian can be a good atheist. This book plays with that idea to take seriously the radical claims of faith and doubt as mutually refining, and everyone is welcome to this conversation. more than enough for me, so, so I'm going to hand over to, to, to wiser people than myself uh, and to Claire and to, and to Rosemary uh, to give any comments they have. We passed lots. Oh, I'm just going to make sure I've switched on. We've cast lots, and isn't that somehow biblical? And I'm, <laughs> and I'm going to go first. Um, so just to start off by, by saying that this... I picked up this book and we're supposed to potentially use it as a Lent book so that we take it as reflections for groups or for ourselves over a period of time during Lent. I found it very difficult to put down. Once I got past, for me, the challenge of the first chapter on forgiveness. Because... Each of the concepts doesn't just speak about the last words of Christ, but they speak so deeply to us about how we see Christ in ourselves and how we see ourselves living out our faith honestly with all the doubt that comes of being people of faith. And 
the concept of forgiveness because it plunges straight in to a conversation around issues of, of, of racism and the ways in which colonial slavery operated made me step back into myself and start to think about forgiving and forgetting and what that really means in terms of your own reality. So I found myself challenged at every point which each of those words, how Jesus challenged the, his, the people of the day, how he spoke to them, how he brought them into the conversation, but then, as you rightly say, what it means for us to have that honest conversation about our own response and our own capacity to, to, to really walk the way of Christ in the way in that he's calling us to do, understanding the fallibility of who we are. And the way in which, for me, you have then engaged uh, the uh, theologians as well as the, the new atheists or the other speakers, the way you've brought them into conversation enables us also to be part of that conversation, to see the bigger picture, to see the wider picture, to hear uh, more voices, but in a way that doesn't, for me, um, make the conversation so difficult and so challenging and so abstract that I can't engage and can't be involved. But actually, you've brought the conversation right home in a way that I'm drawn in. And I want to be in that space, in that room, in that conversation with those people and with God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, all together understanding what it means to me. A few, uh, last year I was training um, some folk um, locally in the Diocese of Southwark and somebody, he just came and he said, do you know, I love the way in which you've written that our diocese is scandalously inclusive. We hadn't written that anywhere. <laughs> so I loved that whatever he read or thought, that's what it said to him. This book, like our Lord, is scandalously inclusive because it will force the reader to read aspects of thinking that they may absolutely disagree with, but it's brought into the room and into the context where we can then reflect on it, cogitate with it, and come out of it more engaged, more enlightened, and more able to have that conversation with others, but more importantly, with God. So for me, this scandalously inclusive book is an excellent text for us to be able to engage with Lent. Thank you very much, Paul. <laughs> so I uh, read the book far too quickly. I had to in order to be ready for tonight, and I wanted to spend much, much longer on it. I absolutely love its um, spiritual and intellectual courage. So uh, each of the writers with whom Paul engages, uh, he engages with them properly. He really listens to them, really pays attention to what they're saying, absolutely does justice to their arguments and uh, responds with equally interesting and diverse and thought-provoking thinkers and writers. And uh, I... So what it, what it um, brought up in me was... Um, how important coming into encounter with the other, whoever the other is, uh, it, how important it is, uh, the way that one comes to the encounter. And he, he talks about, he cites Julian of Norwich um, and the way in which she responded to her visions, what she saw in front of her, the, cru the crucifix that was in front of her and engaged with it. And my thinking with, Ju with Julian of Norwich has... Um, brought out some key features of this sort of encounter that it seems to me we need more than anything today, a transformative encounter, not just what I think, spoken, the other person, what they think, spoken, waiting till they finished me speaking, waiting till I finished them speaking, but 
uh, a performative encounter. So here, here is something presented. Your response is performative. You wake up to it, to it. You actively engage with it, as Julian did with her visions. She entered into them. She took part in them. So the crucifix isn't just something over here. It's something that did speak to her in her visions, but to which she also spoke, to which she also responded, which she interrogated. And in that performative encounter comes the possibility of a, an increased porosity. So you, you come full of doubt, full of uncertainty, ready to learn. You're summoned as a disciple, not as someone who knows who's going to interrogate a, a, a point of view and decide whether you agree with it or not, but someone who's going to m move into a place where you know you're going to be changed, which takes courage, it takes trust. Uh, you come as a summoned disciple, already porous to the encounter, and the encounter itself makes you more porous, and then transformation becomes possible. And in so doing, you bring the world that is your world, your niche, to the encounter. You encounter the niche of whoever you're in uh, conversation with, and a new world emerges. And my own thinking on this kind of encounter, this kind of engagement, is it's absolutely essential, because that is the only way we're going to learn to live as we should do now with the planet and with each other. Uh, with this porous response, not with the sense of someone who knows, who's got a carapace around them, is negotiating relationship is in one plus one plus one, who's objectifying nature, who's seeking to control, uh, to make sense of uh, something out there, but somebody who is absolutely soft to the world around them and to what they're meeting. And this kind of encounter again and again and again was taking place in the book with all sorts of different thinkers with such lively consequences. It, I, I, ha I haven't read a book of theology quite like it for a long time, which absolutely woke me up. It wasn't just something, oh, you know, stuff about Jesus put in a different way, mm. you know, and you kind of go to sleep on it. Mm. Well, you absolutely don't with this book, and I'm so grateful for you for writing it, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, Claire. Paul, but I don't we want to respond before we... <laughs> no, no, uh, um, we, we had dinner uh, just, just before uh, coming <laughs> over here, and uh, 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 I was really uh, touched and, and, and moved and honoured by both, both Claire's and, and Rosemary's uh, kind of feedback uh, and responses. Um, and we were kind of reflecting upon the, I suppose, the nature of kind of theology uh, as a kind of way of thinking about the world and way of being in the world uh, and what characterizes it. Um, uh, and for me, a kind of a painstaking process of, of both um, academic engagement with theology as an academic discipline, but also the lived experience of ordinary theology, you know, the practices of, of, of faith. Um, have over the years kind of shaken that kind of carapace that, that uh, Claire mentioned away from, from a sense of that it had to be about kind of absolutely assured propositional cognitive mastery <laughs> of knowledge uh, to a far more um, experiential uh, um, uh, understanding of, of the, the, the root of, of kind of religious believing. Uh, out of which kind of particular cultural and linguistic forms begin to give shape. But nevertheless, there's an awareness of the provisionality of, of what we think uh, uh, about God and about the significance of God in relation to the world and each other that always humbles what we uh, uh, think we know uh, and therefore uh, shapes with humility how we act towards other people and creation itself. Um, and, and for me, you know, engaging with someone, for example, like w Willie Jennin Jennings, who's kind of has, has uh, looked at the racial dynamics of how theolog theology gets produced, uh, and, and pointed out that a lot of Western theology has been so framed by a sense of mastery and control, which is racialized as a very kind of white paradigm, uh, very conducive to kind of power and control. Um, 
and that we need to be kind of shaken out of this a little bit, or more than a little bit, a lot, <laughs> um, uh, to, to, to reclaim this sense of uh, provisionality and contingency uh, and humility that, that keeps us open to the kind of disruptive activity of God, but also the disruption we can give to each other uh, with our own viewpoints, our own experiences, our own articulations. Um, so yeah, it was great chatting <laughs> with both Claire and Rosemary over dinner uh, and hearing about it, you know, in their own work uh, and ministries, the, the ways in which they begin to see kind of points of connection. Mm -hmm. and I suppose I just wanted to add that if in, if in your normal uh, book you won't come across womanist theology, feminist theology, black theology, create, you won't normally come across them all in one book. But here in this book, they're all brought into the conversation. So you start to be able to hear those voices um, from other places, other spaces, other people. But they're brought into the conversation with great humility without assuming that you know them, but they're brought in to be in conversation. And that, I think, is, is really powerful because for the most people who don't read into that literature, this gives a great introduction, as well as the classics, as well as Nietzsche, as well as <laughs> Marx. But, you know, all of those people are being brought into this conversation. So it's wonderful to span, you know, 200 years thinking and theology and placing it all together um, in, a, in a book that it's accessible and conversational. Can I just push something uh, related to this uh, um, way of thinking, which is Western and uh, would we say it's enlightenment thinking? Uh, uh, and so so I've, I, I've got uh, cancer, I've got a myeloma, cancer of the blood, which uh, I had a lot of treatment for it and now it's quiescent, but every three months I have to have it checked. And just this afternoon I was on the phone to my con oncologist. It was a three-monthly check, so what was the news going to be? Had it woken up? Was it still all right? Well, it's still all right. It's still quiescent, is, is the news. But that treatment, that cancer treatment, absolutely depended on enlightenment approaches to, not, to knowledge. Uh, repeatable exper scientific ex experiment done in the laboratory, brought out into uh, trials on humans, tested, randomized controlled trials. It's very, uh, it's very controlled, it's very other, and yet treatments, uh, uh, not and yet, and treatments which are hi highly effective, demonstrably effective, come out of it. And I've been as anybody would be, immensely grateful for that. Um, and when I had the diagnosis and went into treatment, that's what I said yes to, despite lots of people saying, oh, you should have coffee enemas and, you know, that kind of stuff. And do you really have cancer and do you believe it? And there's, there's a whole, there are industrial quantities of other kinds of ways of, co of coming at this. But my, I, I decided to go down the allopathic route. So I, I really bought into that paradigm, right? However, the experience for me as a patient was messy, furious, joyful, strangely, and, and, and in fact, Julian of Norwich became my companion. And she, because she walks towards pain, because she is porous to what she sees, the pain on the cross, she receives it in herself. She was this fantastic example to me to be porous to everything that was happening to me and all the messy stuff that doesn't fit into the neat boxes of the randomized controlled trials and the drugs, um, the side effects, um, the, the, uh, the things which patient questionnaires, quality of life questionnaires go nowhere near. Like a que I had a question, uh, um, are you afraid of death or are you worried about death? And it was the only question about death. Well, I'd thought about death so much, but that question came n nowhere near what I was experiencing in, in, rela in relation to death. And so you had this, these two paradigms, if you like, sitting side by side. And I think we're, we're at that stage now. So these wonderful, reasonable new atheists um, who say, come on, you have to rely on rationality. It's not, it's not woo-woo, it's demonstrable, it's 
These experiments are repeatable. It's reliable truth and knowledge. We have that. And yet, the mindset that seems to come with that thinks it knows, thinks it's masterly. And the, and the way that we're using that mindset to try and deal with ecological issues, it's not, it's not working. So we've got this funny transitional thing happening, which leaves us all, it seems to me, in a state of tremendous unknowing, tremendous unknowing, even as we acknowledge the value of the different approaches. I mentioned this, this, this over dinner. It's, it's probably one, one of my favourite lines in, in any work of theology ever. Uh, it's such a, a, a work by by someone called Giles Fraser, uh, who's an Anglican priest, but he, he also uh, is a journalist. Uh, but he, he um, wrote an academic book on on, on Nietzsche um, called Redeeming Nietzsche, um, and he gives a very sympathetic account of Nietzsche uh, and re tries to read him theologically. Uh, before he turns to, to critiquing aspects, but the critique all hangs on the following, and it, it's Charles's words, not mine, so excuse the language. But, but <laughs> the, the, the critique flows out of the idea that Nietzsche um, cannot take shit seriously. Mm. Yeah. Cannot take shit seriously. Yeah. In other words, uh, he's afraid yeah. actually of the messiness of, of human life and reality. Uh, he doesn't engage. Uh, uh, in any serious way with the realities of, of human violence, uh, uh, with uh, the problematics of human power and power relations, uh, and prefers some kind of you know, lofty ideal of, of the kind of detached uh, uh, um, uh, superman um, uh, and the kind of uh, contemplative philosopher. Um, and that's something that Christianity uh, uh, can offer uh, as a kind of helpful balancing act. Uh, Nietzsche is absolutely spot on about the, about the role that uh, uh, resentment or resentment plays in, in human psychology uh, over uh, uh, perceived injustice. Uh, um, but, but that actually, if, if, we take, if we take shit seriously and the messiness of human life seriously, which Christianity does at its best, um, we could be aware that uh, rather than claiming we can have some kind of indefatigable final answer to anything. Mm. Uh, we, have, we have to deal with the intricacies and complexities of working through difference uh, 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 to, to achieve understanding a, and a material difference in the world, such as with the ecology or with race or with class or with gender or with sexuality. Um, um, so it could be actually a really mutually refining conversation. Mm. Which is what the book does. Yes, yes. it does. So we, we've heard it's a, a classic. I think, I think, Rosemary, you said that there were sort of three great writers, Nietzsche, Marx, and Dominiac. So <laughs> <laughs> certainly something. <laughs> um, and I don't want to curtail the conversation between the three of you, but we might take a few questions, um, and then any or all of you can answer. Um, I have some from online, but if there are more from online, please do just put them in the Q&A. If you're in the room, just put your hand up, and we'll get a microphone to you. Um, and if we can start off with one just in the corner there... Yes, thank you. That, uh, I'm, I'm really excited. I will buy a copy after this talk. Um, I, I wonder what you have to say to this. Sometimes, you know, I, tr I try to keep up some kind of prayer life, but sometimes I catch myself praying, God, help me with this doubt. <laughs> I doubt something about you. Help me with it. And then... Perhaps as a second part, what can you say to the concept of negative capability, which I find very beautiful. It comes from John Keats, and it's about yeah. being able to live artfully and productively with non-knowing. Hmm. Fabulous. Let's try those. <laughs> Good question. You first. <laughs> <laughs> Your book on doubt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, you. Shall I have yes. a first? That, that's that's yeah. an absolutely fantastic question. It is. Um, um, f f for understandable reasons, I think we often see uh, doubt as somehow inimical to faith or faithfulness. Mm -hmm. um, and, and there's 
reason for that, even scripture itself, you know, the epistle to James t- t- talks about being tossed about like, like a wave in the winds um, uh, um, and, and to be, be, be wary of, of, of doubt. Um, but what, what, we, what I think we see in the cross archetypally is failure and doubt in that, in that kind of central word in particular, but even on the cross itself, is in the same way of thinking, a failure, a failure to meet expectations, that human expectations about who Jesus might have been or should be, uh, uh, the very literal failing of the physical body uh, on the cross, uh, and the failing of, or failure of, of language and understanding that, um, uh, that you know, Jesus himself expresses through, through these, th- this part of Psalm 22, uh, a sense of desolation. Um, um, so, so I, I think what we see is, is, is at that moment, the incarnation is complete. What's been assumed, what's been taken on by Christ is the totality of human life, including its provisionality, its limits, its messiness. And, and that's actually taken up through Christ uh, into the heart of God. So uh, that kind of faithful wrestling with doubt is, is something that is, is faithful. It's not contrary to it. Uh, and, you know, we see this time and time again in thinkers like Augustine of Hippo, you know, in Confessions, he begins every kind of book with a kind of prayer or soliloquy kind of directed towards God, asking for understanding, almost begging for it, but also recognising the provisionality of what theological knowledge he's able to kind of wrestle with. Um, so um, for me, that, that is where that kind of keeps you notion know, of negative capability kind of comes in. This is a, introduces a spark of creativity to Creativity is a way in which you know, the human creature made in the image of God is a creative agent because it's, you know, it's made in the image of God who is the creator. Um, and the kind of limits, the finitude, the temporality of that uh, is a diminishment of the perfection of God, but that's not a negative or pejorative thing. That's a, just a mark of our creatureliness. It's something to rejoice in. So it's a way in which we're sharing in our own diminished way a similitude of, of God's creative activity. Uh, and, and just as God has descended into the messiness of human life in Christ, that, that messiness is taken up in, into the heart of God. And we, it's not a problem. It's some, it is something to be celebrated. It's a way in which there's a faithful relationship between God uh, and, and creation. Uh, and I think I just want to say, once you've read this book, you'll stop asking God to take away your doubt. You'll embrace it. That's it. And, I was, uh, and that's exactly why I wanted Paul to answer, because, you know, throughout the whole book, but particularly if you, if you go to the uh, chapter four on why, it will, you will be able to just w- walk into that conversation. And, and, I, and, I, and I do think, as Paul says, it's natural for us to doubt. So much of our lament comes out because we are not sure. And that's why we have those conversations. And that's, that's, and that's perfectly human and natural. And more, it's more than that. It's creative. Yeah. It's beautiful. Yeah. Well, that, yeah. It's full of potential. It is. If we were sure, we'd be, Absolutely. well, really boring, for one thing, yeah. and yeah. useless. Yeah. useless. Well, that's exactly what I'm, what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, it, is, it, is, it, is, it is humanity itself. And doubt is part of that. Yeah. And so we shouldn't see it as a negativity, but we should see it as, as part of the essence. If you know that groaning and, and, and that wrestling and becoming, doubt fills in that and enables us to move forward. So without doubt, I don't know how we would even move to the next stage of who we are called to be. And it's painful, and that's just part of the deal as well. Yeah. We, don't, we, we shouldn't be looking for certainty and happiness, actually. I don't think. I suppose we can't help it, but yeah. <laughs> I, I just I think it's you know that they're dead ends, aren't they? By definition, they're dead ends. I'll try to fit in as many questions as we can. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, <that's laughs> gang. Yeah. Am I? Yes, I am. On uh, the main topic here is, of course, God. Um, God is generally depicted as being all powerful, all knowing, and all when. He's a full set of alls, overall, in fact. Um, and his main message to humans is through his Bible, his claim. Uh, the Bible may be in written form around a thousand years ago, in written form, um, but us modern humans have been around 300,000 years 
Does this all-powerful God want all modern humans to know that he exists? I've got an initial response. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, there's a Swiss theologian called uh, Karl Barth, who was a kind of reformed uh, theologian, probably the greatest theologian of the 20th century, uh, who very surprisingly says, um, no, the Bible is not the word of God. And it's quite a surprising thing to say, but what he means is the word of God is Jesus Christ. The Bible is that which testifies and points Absolutely. towards. So uh, the, the revelation of God is Jesus Christ in two important senses. One as uh, the eternal word, mm -hmm. through whom all things are made. That's kind of the prologue of John's gospel. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but also uh, Jesus Christ, the incarnate Lord, full of grace and truth, who is, descends to, into the messiness of a particular time and place and a particular people uh, uh, to fully unveil not, not just himself, but, but, the, but the Trinity, to point towards the Father, to be full with the Spirit and send the Spirit out. So f for me... Uh, that the revelation of God is not the Bible. It, it, is, it is the person of Jesus Christ as the eternal word and, and incarnate Lord. Uh, and that spans across, of course, everything from creation through to redemption and beyond to the end of time, uh, the Alpha and the Omega. Um, uh, and and um, f f for me, that, that kind of... Um, more subtly responds to the idea of God's perpetual undergirding influence and activity within that which God has created, sustains, uh, and redeems, and always loves uh, throughout. Uh, and it is a far more kind of open and engaging starting point uh, uh, than uh, getting into knotty questions <laughs> over the temporality of, of Scripture itself. Can, 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 we, can we hear more from the rest Sorry. of the panel rather than... <laughs> So I'm, I'm just, he, incidentally, there's a lot about this ta taken very seriously as, about, as we might say, all the omnis in the book, mm -hmm. the chapter on evil. Um, but the thing I, I'm just interested in you is, is, does God want us to know him? Is that? Does God want humans, all humans, back 300,000 yeah. years, to know that he exists? To know that he exists. I, I don't know, I don't, yeah, yeah, I don't, I, so I don't, I don't know, obviously. Of course I don't know. But, uh, my feeling uh, is God I don't, wants our love and this deep sense that we have of, of being dissatisfied with shallowness, of needing to drink deeply or breathe deeply in 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 peace and and stillness and sense of divinity i think that's it's like god going <laughs> like that and and again the the book talks about that in the chapter on thirst mm. so it's not n it's not knowing that in my view is this enlightenment mindset which is very recent it's not you know bible recent it's few hundred years recent so i'm not some, it's a very human construct and a recent human construct about the nature of, of knowledge, putting, making God in our own image and turning him, him into someone who wants us to know him in what way. It's a, it's a very uh, a dis unsatisfactory frame, not one that makes any sense to me. No, I, I think we should get some more questions because I, I completely agree with you and that's where I was going to go if I answered first on the, the word of God, the in our Lord Jesus Christ. Fantastic. I'm going to take a question right at the back and then a couple from online and then we've, I can see lots of hands up. So, Maybe take two or three. Um, I guess I wanted to... You mentioned Psalm 22, um, which is obviously what Jesus is quoting on the cross. I suppose I just want to hear, I guess, anyone's reflections on what exactly that means in terms of if, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me, is an expression of doubt, is the fact that Jesus is quoting a psalm that then kind of redeems itself in the end. Is it only mm. doubt insofar that it's backed up by certainty, in which case is it doubt at all? Like, what is he doing by quoting, and what does it mean for like Christ to create scripture by quoting scripture, and what was being said about being made in his image? <laughs> 
<laughs> Why does Jesus choose his last words in the image of the psalmist? I guess. Sorry. <laughs> it's a bit rambling. No, because that's a good question. Jesus, it's a good question. Yeah, and certainly, lots of biblical commentators say that Jesus, by creating that one line, of course, intends the whole of the psalm. Uh, and therefore, we should see this uh, not as a cry of desolation, but actually a, 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 a way of invoking the totality, even in the moment of what seemingly is utter despair and abandonment, God is present. I can understand that, that the integrity of that kind of scriptural uh, <laughs> argument, uh, absolutely. Uh, However, it, it, it seems a bit odd to make that claim, um, g given two things. One, he is on the cross in utter agony dying. So to doubt that he actually intends that quite literally seem, seems a little bit uh, tenuous to me. Uh, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure if I was undergoing such uh, absolute agony, the line I would want to communicate and mean is that particular line, not the totality of the psalm. Um, <laughs> other than... Uh, uh, other than to say, uh, this is what I'm experiencing, that this is a real experience, and this is what I really feel right now, even if I can intellectually acknowledge that God nevertheless somehow is still present in the totality of my life. Um, so, so that's a bit, bit more of an emotionally uh, nuanced and attuned ca kind of sense of what's going on, I think, or more likely to have been going on in that moment on the cross. Uh, uh, to simply say he's trying to, to be a bit clever. Uh, by creating a bit of scripture, almost like he's a kind of detached stoic uh, thinker. <laughs> uh, it's, it's such a visceral moment. Mm -hmm. Darkness has fallen. Uh, he's about to die. When he dies, you know, earth splits, rock splits. The curtain of the temple's torn into. This is a really cataclysmic moment uh, 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 that, that's happening. Um, but what we're called to, I think, in that moment is to recognize it is absolutely human absolutely valid and absolutely fine to be absolutely pissed off with God <laughs> and to think God has abandoned us because that is what we're experiencing in that moment. Now, there may be other things in the ecology, of the totality of our lives that allow us to, to think, I have nevertheless tasted the sweetness of God. I have some sense of God's fidelity and some trust in that, but I'm still in utter pain and desolation in this very moment. That is my reality now. And how do I live in that tension? between the totality of, of, of my experiences of God and my current experience of being utterly abandoned. Um, I don't know if you've got anything. I don't think I want to add anything to it, but I, I, I just want to say that the, we, have the, we have the capacity to over-intellectualize the reality of where Jesus was. And so we kind of read backwards and we, as you can say, we read backwards and we think, oh, well, you know, he said it that way, so therefore he was trying to do that. And actually, if you think of the things that run through your mind at the times when you find yourself stretched at the, you know, to the maximum, we have to believe that in his humanity, that's exactly a piece of scripture that, was, that came to his mind, that spoke about exactly what he was feeling at that point in time, because that's what happens to us. Right. We have to recognise that our humanity is there on the cross. And that's how we can read ourselves and understand how the cross reads into our own lives as well. And that's how I feel, that it connects straight to me. Yeah. Hey, hey, Rosemary, you've had a baby, haven't you? Have you had a baby? No. You haven't a baby? I haven't had a baby. There are women, women in here who've had babies, right? So I think that, so friends of mine who've had babies say, there's a moment at the moment of birth, and it's called the ring of fire. And it's the most intense pain that you could possibly, possibly imagine. It doesn't go on for very long. And you don't, you don't, you're often not told about it because it's so bad. Uh, and luckily you forget how bad it is afterwards. I, look, I'm speaking theoretically here, but that's what they tell me. And then that makes it mean you have another baby. But I think of the scream, and you talk about it as a scream. The word, the Greek word is scream. Why hast thou forsaken me? It's, a, it's a, that kind of intensity of pain. That is unbearable pain. And, and I'm, I'm informed by Julian, who, Julian Norwich, who writes about this, asks to experience it, experiences it, and she says, I can't, this is, I can't do this. I can't do this. It's, this is worse than anything you could possibly, possibly imagine. Um, so y you're not thinking, well, let's, which psalm should it be? Or you say, let's have this one, and let's think all the people in the future will, 
We'll go to the end of the... I mean, if you meant the end of the psalm, then you'd say the end of the psalm, wouldn't you? You wouldn't say, mm -hmm. the I am forsaken, why hast thou forsaken me? Mm -hmm. I, I, that's my sense of it, anyway. Yeah. So we have lots of questions in the room, but also lots online. So can I just pick up on a couple of them, um, sort of slightly randomly chosen? Um, so, so one from, from Garth. What is your view of the relationship between science and religious faith? Do you think the progress of scientific knowledge is enabled by God as part of his mission? How could miracles fit into this? Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, well, the answer is absolutely yes. Because all of who we are, I think it's, it's your conversation about um, cancer yeah. and about the, the knowledge that we have gained as human people <laughs> that God has enabled us to, to grow and to know and to do um, all these wonderful things that we can do in the world, but that the other part of it is the mess that we make, that the knowledge that we gain and the beauty that we enable, we then, the flip side of it, is that we then find ways to use it for, for ill, and, and we create the most horrendous challenges that the world is facing at the moment. So I, so I, I do believe that it is, that it is um, God gains us, gives us this capacity but at the same time, part of our human weakness and frailty is to, is to then misuse science, misuse the great knowledge that we get, um, and, and then create the damage that we, we see in the world at the moment. That's so, so I do think it is, it is for, of God. Yes. I, I also think it's very good for us to put things which are completely, apparently, mutually exclusive together in our minds and not just dismiss one for the sake of holding to the other. Let's not dismiss either. Again, the book is a very good example of this, and see what happens. Mm. Um, another question, just uh, one very quick one, um, from Jeffrey Knapp in Chicago. Uh, can you just repeat and spell the name of the 20th century theologian who said the Bible points to Jesus, who is the word of God? Uh, Karl Barth, B-A-R-T-H. Fantastic. And then related to that, um, a regular attendee called Anonymous Attendee um, <laughs> says, they seem to come to everything we do. Um, if, if the Bible is not the definitive word of God rather than Jesus, how are we to discern which parts of the Bible are we to regard as reliable? Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, so I'm going to, what I, the way I always think of the Bible, I feel, I, I say my parishioners, it's a, com it's a written conversation that has been inspired by God, um, but it's all based, for me, on uh, our understanding, for us, of the ways in which Jesus came into the world as the Word of God. And all of the complexity of the Bible, written from very different perspectives, different people, all of it has been revealed to us to be part of an ongoing conversation between the words of God, Jesus Christ, the living word, between the words on the page and between what is inscribed in our hearts. And, and so it's a dialectical conversation. And the Bible, for me, is a dialectical conversation. So we need all of it, not bits of it. And, and I would say also um, there, the, uh, the Bible is to be meditated upon um, and, and porously received. And the, and the idea of trying to rely on it, that's, it seems to me that's this technological mindset again, the scientific mindset, which says, which tries to sort everything out and be quite binary as well. Uh, meditate on it. See what happens when you simply receive the words. What happens? What's the effect? What, what grows? What diminishes? Um, not a rule book, is it? It isn't. No, and, and, well, to, to mention Carl Barth again, I mean, he, ha he has a very which in your sense of, of the phrase word of God. You know, it's in one sense it refers primarily to Jesus Christ, but can refer, of course, uh, as a synonym for, for the Holy Scriptures, as a witness to the revelation of Jesus Christ, but, but also can refer to the kind of, this kind of, yeah, the dialogical activity of, mm -hmm. of the faithful. So the preachers, teaching, mm -hmm. communities and conversation mm -hmm. uh, as they engage with the person of Jesus Christ and gather around the, the, the scriptures which point towards uh, 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 that particular figure uh, 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 and person of the, of the Trinity. And I, I think that's qu quite a rich and nuanced way. So, yeah, like you say, Claire, rather than setting you know, our text up uh, as ex an exclusive set of 
uh, theological intellectual propositions. It's far more kind of lived experiential dynamic of engaging with the person of Jesus Christ, uh, who is uh, you know, archetypally uh, formed creation, uh, been sent to reveal the Trinity, uh, uh, and through whom all things have been made, sustained, loved, redeemed. I'll come back in the room. There's a number of hands up, so can I ask particularly the questioners to be brief? Yeah. Good luck, Guy. <laughs> I really enjoyed the, um, the discussion. Uh, I, I have a... Oh, Is that better? Yeah. yeah. Um, I've really enjoyed the discussion, as I say. Um, for, for me, personally, I find the writings of people like Dawkins and Hitchens um, to be very zoomed out, sort of the astrophysics... Mm or um, maybe that side of uh, life, but we're not species, we're people, we're atoms in that system, and part of the consolation of philosophy, and um, maybe, maybe this doubt is part of that kind of quantum physics that we're doing on the actual individual point of what we're, what's happening to us, which I think is the more interesting part. Um, if that's the case, and given that there's room uh, for doubting Thomas in in the church and in the Pantheon of Saints, potentially. Um, where, what one thing, maybe, from each of you, would you like to see the Church of England as, as, a, as a body move towards uh, if we are to take the last 100 years of uh, scientific discovery and the development of the church in that time? What do you think will be happening in the next 100 years? What does the Church of England need to be able to do to be able to talk intelligently to that wide church that we have of doubters? Mm -hmm. For me, it's to stop speaking and start listening, uh, uh, and you know, to work on interpreting that listening theologically. So not to limit either uh, the person of Jesus Christ or the activity of the Spirit to the institutional church, but to recognize that Christ is a cosmic figure, a cosmic person, shaping all things, through whom all things have been made. Um, has shaped the entirety of what can be experienced and is experienced, um, uh, and that the spirit uh, uh, energizes that kind of creativity and productivity. So actually, rather than thinking we know and can wag a finger yes to this, no to that, that perhaps we, ne we now need to be a lot more uh, ready and able to uh, pause, stop, listen, and learn from when people wag their fingers at us, because perhaps they're wagging their finger and they're right. One thing each. I'll go last. Oh, okay. I would say that it could attend to the deep, deep spiritual thirst there is, and rise to meet it. Um, and the image I have, and this relates to my work at Westminster Abbey Institute, we work with the public servants who are the neighbours of Westminster Abbey on Parliament Square. When I first started, I, 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 I did a feasibility study and felt this thirst, deep thirst, these people who were really trying to do the right thing and didn't know if they were because they were too busy to stop and think, and they wanted to sit, step back, breathe, and reconnect to the vocation to public service. They were desperate for some depth, and I had this image of a, um, of a of a of a parched sponge, a brittle sponge, and that we could water it. That Im I've been doing this work for ten years now, and that image has changed, and it's changed to this. It is a parched field still, but the water is in the field, and there's maybe the slightest movement of a hand to turn the soil, as we all know if we've tried this with our hands, turn the soil and, and the moisture is revealed. And that's the image I have of where maybe the Church of England could go. Do you think it will? <laughs> <laughs> and I would just say that I think the word I used earlier, the two words were scandalously inclusive. Yes. I would love that the Church of England, in the breadth of what that means, yeah. Learn to be scandalously inclusive. Yeah. Take a risk. Christ. <laughs> yeah. Is it working? Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask Paul a bit more about new atheism um, and the role of doubt in that, because you had your rogues gallery up there. The, <laughs> the old atheists like Hume, you completely see where doubt fits in. It's a sceptical 
view of the world, but Christopher Hitchens, I can't think of anyone who had <laughs> less self-doubt. <laughs> Christopher Hitchens, it's, uh, you know, if you think of the things you might associate with him, anger, uh, contempt, humor, certainty. He was, a, he, was a, you know, he was a genius at hate. He was an incredible mm -hmm. hater. In his uh, autobiography, there's a bit where he says, when the fatwa was issued against Salman Rushdie, he was ecstatic because he knew for the rest of his life who he could hate, anyone who didn't stand up for Salman Rushdie. So w where do you conclude doubt fits into the new atheism? I, th I think it's half complete. So, so I have great, great sympathies, I have to say, <laughs> with the new atheists. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, uh, I'll, I'll be hard pushed to, to disagree with a lot of their kind of diagnosis, uh, whether that's kind of over the political problems that are often uh, get, uh, come out of a consequence or of uh, kind of uh, religious extremism or even kind of more quotidian, everyday kind of religious belief. Um, or, or they're kind of taking down of particular theological framings of God and religious belief. Uh, so uh, they're kind of, that, that kind of very, yeah, as you say, very visceral, angry doubt, I, I actually share, I, I would, would want to agree with. Uh, but but in, in a way, it's, it's, it's half complete in that it's not quite been turned in on, on itself, both, both in terms of questioning what tradition am I inhabiting and in what way is that, uh, contingently framing my understanding of the world and myself, but also half complete in sense of uh, reflexively turning inward uh, uh, and uh, questioning what are the potential pressure points in the way I'm arguing, thinking, being in the world that I should be perhaps more aware of and therefore maybe a little bit more hesitant uh, 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 with um, the certainty uh, I at least give off. Um, so in, in a way, there's almost an equivalence in that regard to um, a kind of doctrinaire atheist and a religious, a, a dogmatic re religious person who's completely intractable and inflexible. Mm. Um, uh, they suffer from the same ailment of not being quite reflexive. I once spent the night with Christopher Hitchens Drinking whiskey, uh, <laughs> drinking whiskey, and arguing about religion, and this public uh, persona that wasn't there. It, it was he was he was a, it was brilliant. It was such an interesting uh, exploratory conversation. I don't remember any of it because we <laughs> drank too much whiskey. But but it it went on all night, and I think in his. Autobiography somewhere, he says, he, that those are his favourite conversations all night with religious people. And I wondered if he was thinking about me. It was a long time ago. <laughs> well, I know, I know it doesn't. Uh, it, it, but the conversation was not one between two people who, who thought they knew what was true. Rosemary, it was exploratory. It was an exploratory conversation. And it went on, why would you keep going on all night if you didn't really blooming care about this? <laughs> no, the whiskey too. <laughs> no, all I was going to say is that um, in all of this wonderful questions, buy the book, read the book. Yeah, it's true. It is explored really beautifully. Yes, there we are. It is explored really beautifully. So, um, and, and some of the words that I'm hearing um, that we haven't even mentioned here, that are really important. So words like anger, words you know that are explored, that like hate. They're all you know. These are explored deeply mm -hmm. and help us to, I think, just come to a more gentler um, understanding of where people's positions can be and how we can take diagnoses and still ha enable ourselves to to go forward, not necessarily taking their prognosis, but really reflecting on the diagnosis. That, that people have, have made of us and our faith and our certainty. And isn't it liberating to think you can accept a diagnosis but you don't have to accept the prognosis? Because you get the best, don't you? Um, we are beginning to run out of time, but I will try and fit in as many as we can. But if people could be brief, that would be really appreciated. Thank you. Um, I'd like to return to Jesus saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Uh, I must admit, I have not seen it so much as an expression of doubt, as shock. Um, for this reason that 
I think Jesus, there's plenty of evidence in the Gospels that Jesus expected to be crucified. In fact, he almost brought the cross upon himself by provoking the authority of his day. And what is also evident is that he had a very um, close sense of the presence of God as his heavenly father that went <coughs> with him through his life. Now, on the cross, that seems to me to be shattered. The cross turned out to be far worse mm. than he ever expected. Um, his heavenly father was absent. And I think that took him by surprise. So I would interpret the saying more along those lines than doubt, although the, the two may be closely connected. Nice. Any reactions from any of you? Nice. Yes. yes. <laughs> yes. We agree. <laughs> I, yeah, fantastic. Yes, was, I didn't think it would hurt this much. Is it? Yes, was it? Would it? And that feels very true to me too. Here I am presented with something. I didn't think it would hurt this much, but it's happening. So yes, I think that's lovely, lovely thing to reflect on. Then we'll have a question at the back. Um, yeah, um, I, I, I was wondering whether it might be possible to say that there were certain points w where theology became influenced by the Enlightenment the extent that things like the synoptic problem, and you see you know, the, the kind of algorithmic graphs that have been yeah. used seem to be yeah. a function of yeah. you know, that type of extension of scientism to all aspects of human thought. Yeah. The, the, the thing that you seem to be implying, Paul, is that in contrast to these other figures, you know, who are, who are effectively <laughs> rationalist, that, that Faith is a form of artistic, creative activity. That, that, that doubt mm. is involved in artistic production, perhaps less so in other modes of thought. That's not to say that science mm. doesn't involve creativity and isn't uh, and it has has struggle. And uh, also, and this is just a, a, a revelation. Thank you. Is it seems to me that perhaps Christ became fo most fully human in those last words. Yes, I mean, it, I mean, it's a remarkably kind of tender, vulnerable moment. Uh, um, uh, you know, you, you could, in certain of the Gospels, such as Luke, for example, Christ almost appears quite you know, calm, philosophic on the cross. Uh, but we've got a real vulner visceral vulnerability here. You, you know, Claire mentioned it, even, even you, you can translate, he screamed this. He didn't just say it, he screamed it. Uh, um, I was quoting you. Just to be well, clear, <laughs> in the book. I'll, I'll, I'll check my, my sources, Claire. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, when, when it comes to the character of faith, I think primarily faith is, 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 is you know, belongs to God. Uh, um, in the sense that God is, is the one who is faithful. You know, we have a great, great piece of scripture, the one who calls is faithful. Uh, and when we experience faith, we're, we're sharing in something about the characteristic of God as trustworthy. It inspires that kind of response, but it's, but it's given to us as a gift as well. It, it is that kind of uh, uh, almost kind of co-creative thing. But, but the radical priority begins with God's action, God's grace, both in the revelation of God's character as being trustworthy and sure, uh, but the, the self-disclosure to us, the gifting of that, that sense to, to us in faith. Um, but the life of faith certainly is one full of <laughs> creativity, or it should be, um, uh, because that, that always recognises the kind of contingency of things, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the kind of responsibility to, you know, faith to seek understanding, to, to wrestle with God like, like Jacob wrestles with, uh, with, with the kind of angel uh, uh, and is wounded in, 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 as a result, but has a new identity as a result as well. Um, so, so you know, at its best, faith is, is a really, really beautiful thing. Um, at its very worst, uh, it, it is uh, a very um, potentially damaging thing uh, uh, if, if it becomes a straitjacket rather than an invitation to freedom. That's my a experience. A good, scien good science is full of doubt, of course. Right. Karl Popper would say... Yeah. You have, all you have is a hypothesis. You must try and disprove your hypothesis. And it's only ever hypothesis. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you stop thinking it's a hypothesis and think it's true, you block off the possibility of learning more. And, w and we know how science uh, opens up and opens up and opens up. And things that we thought were true yesterday become 
untrue today because of continued questioning. So there's a kind of creativity and uncertainty in that journey as well, it strikes me. Mm. No, I, uh, again, I should have gone first this time. Yes, <laughs> you should. I should have let you. Yeah. Yeah. At the confirmation service, the bishop says, do you believe in God? I can remember aged 16 or 17 giving the obstructed reply. <laughs> the honest reply would have been, well, I'll give it a try. <laughs> <laughs> faith seems to be a prolonged experiment, which you yeah. can't do without doubt and even scepticism. Yeah. Yeah. Is the church itself guilty of disabling doubt? Good. Bishop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Go on, you do the... <laughs> I love this. I, I, I think the comment that you've made is absolutely right, because it is constantly for us to be in that engaged relationship with God and our faith. And that's where doubt comes in, because we need to be reflective of the whys and the wherefores at that point in time. And at different stages in our life, we're going to need to be have uh, to, uh, to ask, ask God questions and the church um, questions about what is happening at the time. At the moment, here we are in the Church of England and there is uh, so much uncertainty about how we are going to walk forward through this year and there is so much doubt in the church, but out of that doubt, I think, will be born a new thing and we will become a different way of being church. I think one of the things that we haven't brought out from this book is the way in which you constantly say that we are being gifted with this new thing and it is that relationship of God with us through Jesus Christ and through the, his presence on the cross that's what brings into being this new thing and I think that the Church of England and any church needs to know that that they are not the certainty God is and we are the provisional and we need to remember that and live with that. I think confirmation should be a much more dramatic thing. Yeah. It's t t way too anodyne, don't you think? Well, I wasn't teaching the class. <laughs> 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 yes, there's a question up there. Thank you all so much for the gift of the book and everybody for the discussion. Um, I've only read half the book, so please excuse me if it's in the second half. <laughs> <laughs> Just struck me that one term that hasn't come up yet in the book and certainly hasn't come up this evening in our discussion is agnosticism. Mm. Um, I just wonder whether it's the elephant in the room, really, in mm. the, the, the sort of faith-doubt or faith-atheism dichotomy that, that we're kind of breaking apart. If anything, is almost caused by, by the, the rise of this third term which hasn't been around all that long. Um, and, and against agnosticism, faith looks like certainty, um, which from the inside, you know, I think we know that it isn't. I just wondered what you thought about that, whether it came into your thinking and whether it's a, a, a busted flush and <laughs> in the enlightenment furniture that we need to ditch. <laughs> That's a great question, Rob. Bishop, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I mean in, in the final two chapters of the book, uh, I, I, I turned to, to, to a phrase, you know, theological atheism, or a form of, it's, it's something kind of Dennis Turner uh, uh, wrote about, which it isn't to say that you have theologians going around saying God, in a straightforward sense, does not exist, I don't believe in God, but, but, it, but it is more in that kind of theologically attuned agnosticism, you want to, to phrase it, in the sense of um, being aware of the failure of theological language, both morally, but also uh, in terms of uh, its ability to fully or adequately capture who God is, uh, and, and engaging in spiritual processes of being humbled, refined by that. So it's not that you can't say something about God, but you need to be aware of its provisionality, its contingency, uh, be willing uh, to, to uh, speak with some hesitation. Uh, uh, in terms of being definitive in, w in what you're saying, so have that kind of humility attached to it. Um, so, uh, no, I don't talk about anywhere, I'm afraid, agnosticism in the book. Uh, uh, but certainly, um, it would depend what you mean by agnostic, I think. Um, uh, I think if, if it was one marked by that kind of epistemological curiosity, uh, uh, but also humility, 
that is open to disruption, uh, I'd, I'd be comfortable with it. But if, it's, if simply it would be an undecided, <laughs> um, I'd be less comfortable with that. Because, because uh, you know, uh, I think we need to be, uh, it's not that we need to be paralyzed uh, into not uh, acting in light of our beliefs, uh, but simply to, to be framed, to remain open that that can change. Mm. To be, we can be disrupted in what we currently think we know. Or, or, or proclaim or say. Um, so I've skirted around your question a bit, but, but I hope it addresses it. Ma it's made me think, I think a lot of people I know who call themselves agnostics do so out of humility, actually. Mm. Just they wouldn't, they wouldn't presume to be more than that. And that's rather wonderful. It's, that's very open. So we're almost out. I'd just like to finish with combining a couple of the questions which have come online. Um, which are quite related. I'll try and do them smoothly. We've, we've been surrounded by this quote from Bloch here uh, about only an atheist can be a good Christian. Um, do you agree and are you good Christians? To combine the two <laughs> questions. <laughs> uh, I agree and I'm a very good atheist. <laughs> <laughs> I agree and I think I'm a very good Christian. <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> I think that's the perfect trilogy of answers, isn't it? So I, I, I love the range of answers yes. we've had there. Which just, just proves how, how, how wonderful this has been. I, I don't know what the correct word is for a trinity of Jesuits, but you have been a fantastic trio tonight. So, uh, Rosemary, Paul, Claire, thank you so very much for being with us. <laughs> um, the book itself is available from all good <coughs> bookshops near you, and if you are here in the room, there is a very good bookshop just outside. And that's it for tonight, but I hope you'll come to more of the events here at the Intellectual Forum. They cover a really wide range. The next three we have are with Professor Yasmin Lari, a distinguished uh, Pakistani architect, talking about how you rebuild sustainable communities in a place like that. Uh, then we're having the global launch of a, a, a report on how to enhance vaccine uptake against covid with the Global Health Security Network. And then we have the Lisa Jardine Memorial Lecture with Nadine Ackerman talking about the role of editors and archivists. And then we're talking about cyber and deep fake and generative AI uh, and much, much more. So I hope we'll see you again here at Jesus College at the Intellectual Forum. Thank you very much and have a very good evening. Thank you.